This was his realization. So they came to a conclusion. The only way to cure this disease, should I continue? Is we have to break his faith in devotees. We have to prove to him that these Vaishnavas are corrupt. Then he'll lose his faith and he'll come back to a normal state of ruling his kingdom. Then they made a plot. In his palace, he had a beautiful deity of Lord Rama. And Rama had wonderful jewelry. And it was the Sri Vaishnavas, the devotees, that were taking care of all the deity worship. We will steal the deity's most precious necklace. And then we will prove that it was the devotees who out of greed and envy stole it from God. Ah, they were very excited about this plot. So the ministers themselves stole this precious necklace. And then they reported to the king that the Lord's necklace has been stolen and we have done an investigation. It is those devotees. It is the Sri Vaishnavas. Out of their greed, they have stolen it. We are going to take them to trial and we're going to do justice to them. We will punish them according to the law. When King Kulasheka heard this, they were telling all the details of the investigation. He stood up from his throne and with a voice like thunder, he said, I will not hear any more of this. This is not possible. A Vaishnav will never steal. Even in the farthest reaches of the mind of a Vaishnav, such a thought could never cross them. A Vaishnav is a devotee of God. A Vaishnav is pure. A Vaishnav would never, ever yield to such corruption. I will prove to you my faith in the innocence of these devotees. Immediately, my servant, immediately, bring me a vessel which is inhabited by a venomous cobra. Immediately, I will stick my hand in that prison house for this venomous snake. And if it bites me, then let me die. But if these devotees are innocent, there is nothing that can happen against me. And then Kulak Shekhar, without a single thought, he thrust his hand and his entire arm into a vessel that was the abode of a hungry, venomous serpent. And he held it in there and took it out, completely pure and whole. At that point, the ministers realized he is too much for us. <laughs> this is just too much. <laughs> his faith in God and his faith in the devotees of God is unshakable. So they bowed at his feet and they were just repentant and they brought him back the necklace and they said, actually, we stole it. <laughs> We thought you were going crazy, so we have, we have framed, we have set up and, and incriminated these innocent devotees. We, we beg forgiveness of you. And King Kula Shekhar, just like Ram, forgave Kakasura, the, the crow that, that defiled the sanctity of Sita. Kula Shekhar forgave them. 
He said, you are forgiven. Carry on with your services. But you should not accuse innocent people. The atonement is, you should serve them. That was the last thing they wanted to hear. But after this incident, Maharaj Kula Shekhar was thinking in his heart, why am I living with these vile, shameless, scheming ministers? It's like living in blazing fire. And so much of the world is like this. And with this in mind, he coronated his son, Dhritabrata, named after grandfather, as the king. And Kula Shekhar Maharaj went to Sri Rangam, where he spent the rest of his life living very simple, doing humble service to the Lord and living, doing humble service to the Lord's devotees constantly absorbed in hearing the glorious pastimes and chanting his holy names. And as he was leaving, he wrote a beautiful verse. In this verse, he speaks that Man has given me a crown saying that I'm the king. But my Lord, you are the king of kings. And I am in my most elevated position when the crown on my head is your lotus feet. This is not just a story. King Kula Shekhar's writings and his example is honored even today by hundreds of millions of people. And one beautiful thing we could learn from this story is how extraordinary it is to be absorbed when we read the Holy Scriptures, we should not think that this is simply something that has happened. King Kula Shekhar was living in the present moment. That was his absorption. In this world, the Bhagavad Gita explains There are situations beyond our control. Old age, disease, death, so many reversals, whoever we may be. To try to be the controller in a world where we have such temporary and limited control is a very frustrating situation. But by simply humbling ourselves, and understanding the supreme control of the Lord, and understanding the beauty and the love of the Lord, and reciprocating with that love in this very life we can access the supreme happiness and we can share that happiness with others as it is said in giving we receive giving of our heart that is culture. Real culture is about 
respect and service to others with the ultimate goal of pleasing God. Mahatma Gandhi was asked by a British reporter, you have lived in the West, what is your opinion of Western culture? And Gandhi's famous reply was, my opinion is it's a good idea. Which means he just didn't see any culture. He saw tremendous material progress in science and technology and legislation. But real culture is about respect, about service, it's about humility, it's about real faith in God. Now certain these, certainly these qualities are present all over the world. But wherever they're prominent, that is a cultured person. That is a cultured environment. And here in India, which has such a deep culture of humility, respect, service and devotion, it is rapidly dwindling. Just the other day, Niranjan Swami Maharaja's sister, who is an administrator of hospitals in Boston, Massachusetts of the United States of America. She was expressing her heart, how sacred and important tradition is. During our parents' time, even in America, there was tradition. But as the generation passed, those traditions were considered to be irrelevant and counterproductive. How sacred! Tradition that upholds and preserves sanctified values is. through hundreds of years of Mughal rule, through hundreds of years of British rule, preserved its culture and tradition to a very large extent. That the deterioration of the Taj Mahal has been greater in the last 25 years than in the centuries and centuries and centuries since it's been built. because of the acid rains and the pollutions. That's the way the culture of life is becoming as well. Our Guru Maharaj, Srila Prabhupada, he explained it in a very nice way. He said that yukta vairagya, technology, science, progressive medicine and, 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 and transportation, they are not bad. They are good if they are supported by proper values. But otherwise, they can disintegrate the integrity of human beings if we become too much obsessed with these things. Srila Prabhupada said that, of course, this was back in the 1960s and 70s. India is a poor country, like a lame man. And the West, very powerful physically, but quite blind. But if the blind man gets on the shoulders, I'm sorry, if the lame man gets on the shoulders, of the blind man, 
who has strength, then together they can make great progress. So taking the, the achievements, the modern achievements of the West, and combining them with the wisdom and the value of the traditions of the East can give such great benefit to the whole world. My dear friend Gary, last time we were here I told a little portion of the story of our relationship together. And because most of you are the same people and you've been watching the video, I didn't want to tell the same story again. So I just went off into a tangent like King Kula Shekhar and just started talking. But. <clears throat> Gary and I were talking. And the India that he visited in 1971, when he first came, and the India he sees today is very much a different place. It's, there are many modern facilities that give a lot of comfort to a Westerner. There's bottled water. Gary and I were getting typhoid and, and dysentery and amoebic cysts and all these things all over the place every day practically in those days because we just drank any well water anyone gave us. But even if there was bottled water in those days, we couldn't afford it. But there are many conveniences which make us feel, make a foreign person who's come after 30 years feel safer, but at the same time to see how rapidly people's consciousness have degraded, how rapidly traditions are disintegrating. It's very worrisome and it's very sad because that's the greatest thing the people of India have. Traditions based on deep philosophy and scientific spiritual knowledge. Traditions which uphold honesty, integrity, simplicity, and purity. That are always keeping us connected to divinity. And it is a wonderful, wonderful thing that I see here at Avanti and Yasha's home. Although they have very modern ways, in many ways, they're raising their children with very, very beautiful values and traditions. Last year we went to Brindavan and did Govardhan Parikrama. Yes? It's Several of our brahmacharis, who are staunch, austere sadhus, they were there. And for those of you who have done, how many here have done Govardhan Parikrama? It's walking around the sanctified mountain of Govardhan Hill, which is 21 kilometers. And we all did it, according to tradition, with bare feet. And these, some of the adults, I'm not going to go into details, but they were really struggling. But these three children, Vedanta, Nirvana, and little Sloka, they were blissfully dancing around the hill. Nirvana was leading us, <laughs> so enthusiastic. These brahmacharis, by the end of the Govardhan Parikrama, I've never seen them like this. They were they were practically taking the dust of Sloka's feet. They were praising her, a little girl. How enthusiastic, what, what natural sentiments are imbibed within her. So we're very proud to see this effort 
And it's a nice example. It's a very nice example. The Bhagavad Gita tells Yad Yad Achadati Stres Tas Tad Tad Evita Rojana Sayat Pramanam Kurute Lokas Tad Anubharatate. What leaders and influential people in society do, the common people will follow. And how important it is that people with influence uphold the integrity and the values of the sacred ideals that our forefathers and the saints have given to us. Because the purpose of human life is to purify the heart, to love God, and to be an instrument of God's love in everything we do in life. There is nothing else that will give us the joy and the meaning and fulfillment as that. And beyond that, it awakens the eternal essence of our existence, our eternal relation with the Lord. In this age of Kali, the chanting of the holy names is so simple. It purifies the heart. But if we want to chant properly, we have to live with humility and proper spiritual values. Srila Prabhupada, he taught very strongly that philosophy and religion without good character is all useless. So to live with good character, to imbibe that within our children, and to inspire that in the hearts of those around us, that is true dharma. And the greatest of all good character is to be an instrument of God's love, which could be accessed by all of us by sincerely chanting His holy names. And I'd like to conclude my short talk tonight by expressing my deep gratitude to Gary and his younger brother, Richard. Richard is here. Uh, I grew up with both of these celebrated personalities from early childhood, through the various transitions of life. Whenever they come, I'm a little fearful of what they may say about my past, because <laughs> I have no control over them. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Why should we? We are what we are. But I'm so very, very happy that they have come. I remember we were from a little village in northern Illinois called Highland Park. And there just wasn't anything to do. And when you're a teenager in America, you're always looking for something to do. And on Saturday night, we'd, all week, we'd go to school waiting for Saturday night. Then Saturday night, Gary and Richard would pick me up in their car and some of our other friends. we go in the car, say, what will we do tonight? Say, well, let's look for something to do. And we go this place and that place looking for something to do. And by about midnight, we realize there's nothing to do. <laughs> it's 
that accurate? So it was a simple life. But it was a very nice, pious neighborhood. And for a teenage boy, a pious neighborhood means there's nothing to do. <laughs> in America, in America. <laughs> so by God's grace, there was nothing to do. <laughs> we were protected. <laughs> but I love them very much. Even though I'm so different they accept me and it's a beautiful relationship. They will be leaving back for Malibu, California the day after tomorrow. Would either of you like to give parting words to our congregation? Because this is the last chance you'll have to speak. You could come up on stage if you like. Gary, you can also come. Now is the time I have to pray to Krishna. <laughs> Before you begin, Gary and Richard, I would just like to inform you that I'm intensely praying to Krishna that you will say the right things. <laughs> and more than that, I'm praying that you don't say the wrong things. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Richard is a highly specialized massage therapist. And Gary is a physical trainer in the Malibu gym. Does it work? Yeah. Thank you, Swami. Thank you very much. Um, from the moment I, I walked off the plane almost two weeks ago, I've been treated with such unbelievable warmth and affection, and I still don't know why, <laughs> what I've done to deserve all this. And um, I know that it's because you all love Swami so much, as I do. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank, thank you all. And so much love I've received from several of the devotees who have spent as much time as, as we wanted, doing what we wanted, and so much more. Um, I'm not going to say all your names, but you know who you are, and I do want to thank you so much. You know, at home, um, I have a lot of friends, but sometimes I can't even find somebody to have dinner with, and here, there's so many people that want to have dinner with me that I don't know who to have dinner with. And at home, it's really hard to find somebody to take you to the airport with all the traffic we have in L.A. And here, even at five in the morning, there's a dozen people that want to take me to the airport. So I'm just so deeply, deeply touched. And I'm so honored to be here. And I'm still wondering what I've done to deserve all this, but maybe I'll be wondering for the rest of my life. <laughs> Thank you all. Namaste. It's good to be back in Bombay. It's, oh, oh. it's good to be back here. I think some of you or most of you remember me last year. So... Um, it's really an honor and privilege to be back with all you wonderful people. I was so moved and touched and fulfilled last year by my visit that I decided I had to share it with some people in my life that mean a lot to me. So this year, I didn't come alone. I came with two good friends, Lynn and Devin, who left today. But they asked me to, once again, 
express to you their love and gratitude for all that everyone here has done for them. And I also brought my mother's sister, my lovely Aunt Shelley, who left earlier, and she also expressed, asked me to tell you once again how grateful she is. And she hopes, we all hope, that some of you will come visit us in America someday so we can show you some love and, and affection like you've done for us. And um, <laughs> Shelly is an interesting woman. She owns a professional basketball team, so she wants to take all of you to the game if any of you are ever in L.A. during the season. By the way, I'll just mention briefly, she's owned the team for many, many years, for like over 20 years, and they've never been a winning team. They've always been a terrible team. So this year, as they, she decided, because they're such a terrible team, she could come to India and not miss very much. But to her, all of our amazement, they're having the best season they've ever had. They're 12 games over 500, and they're in the thick of the playoff hunt, and she gives all credit to Maharaj and to the devotees and to Lord Krishna. So, Hare Krishna, thank you. <laughs> and um, I am so happy to have brought my family and my friends here, some of them, to have seen for themselves all the love and hospitality that you gave to me last year, and it's totally been extended to them. And um, speaking for all of them, I, I thank you so much. I'm so moved. I feel so much love for all of you. And, um, but most of all, for Maharaj, I don't think I'm going to embarrass him. His prayers probably are going to be answered. <laughs> there really isn't much to embarrass him about, though. I, I've searched my mind for things that might be of interest to you about him. And there's many interesting things, but very few embarrassing things, because he's always been such a, a wonderful, wonderful ex person, you know. He's my example, my hero. You know, he, he says that... Um, that the actions of our lives determine our future, you know, that what we do now determines our karma for our next birth. And I must have done something really good in my last life to have had a friend like Maharaj for 40 years. I think about it, and I don't even feel worthy of it, and yet when I look into his beautiful face, I see he truly loves me in spite of my entanglement in the web of Maya, is that how you say it? <laughs> Which to me is just amazing. He just doesn't judge me or um, have high expectations of me other than that I give him my love and, and that is always going to be unconditional. I know every one of you here understand that because I, I know you all feel the same way. And so, um, I love you more than, as much as any human being I've ever loved, and thank you so much for, um, for everything you've given me for the past 40 years. Now, is there anybody that wants me to embarrass him? <laughs> no, I won't do that, I'm sorry. And I don't know what else to say except thank you again, and with your blessings, we would like your permission to come back again next year. <laughs> and uh, if there's any questions that you have, either of myself or my brother Richard, we would be very happy to answer them. Otherwise, um, we'd be happy to turn it over back to Maharaj. One thing. Next year, he's going to bring a whole carload of them, a whole plane load of them. <laughs> The floor is all yours, my friend, Maharaj.